Hello, my friends. Ken Berry from OB Farms here. Today, I have the great honor and pleasure, and I mean those both equally, of, of chatting with Dr. Peter Ballerstadt, a forage, forage agronomist. Uh, one of the one of my he's my go to guy for subjects like this. Today, we're going to be discussing many, many things, not just forage agronomy. We're going to be discussing human health, human diet. Uh, how to get started with your farm, why you want ruminant animals on your farm, why ruminant animals are not destroying your health or the health of our wonderful, beautiful planet Earth, and uh, more. There's no telling what we'll talk about in this. So if you know anybody that currently thinks that eating meat is bad for the human body or that raising meat is bad for the planet, please share this video with them immediately. Welcome, Dr. Ballerstadt. Thank you, Dr. Barry. It's a pleasure to connect. Um, glad to be here. Uh, one might even say that ruminants rule. So let's get at it. Ruminants rule. I like that. That's a new hashtag. I'm going to start using that. So let's start with just a quick um, CV of your uh, the reason that I ha I'm having you on this channel. What you're an expert in and why people should care. So my background is in agronomy, so those aspects of plant and soil science uh, in agriculture, specifically in forages, those are plants that we grow for animals to consume directly, so hay, pasture, silage crops. Uh, I have a minor in ruminant nutrition, and so unlike human nutrition, animal nutrition is a functional scientific discipline. Um, we evaluate the results on a very regular basis, and nobody blames the cow when the milk yield goes down, right? Um, and ruminants are those animals that have this wondrous anatomy that allows them to use high fiber, low fat, poor protein diets and produce <laughs> red meat, milk, other products. Um, if they, they turn fiber, they turn carbohydrate into fat for us instead of us. So I, I, I think that, you know, humanities, um, modern humans wouldn't exist had there not been ruminants. Modern yes. societies exist because of ruminants and we won't meet the goals of 2050 let alone today without improving our ruminant animal agricultural systems globally yes i totally agree with every word that just came out of your mouth uh so many people are you know it's it, when I, I i'm a student of human nutrition and that has taken me into also being an armchair student of archaeology anthropology and animal biology. My undergraduate degree was in animal biology. And so I knew at a very young age that uh, not only does each species of animal have a proper diet, an optimal diet for them, but when you start looking at animal nutrition, this is, I mean, this is not up for debate. You guys know exactly what to feed an animal to make them ultimately healthy or ultimately marbled or or unhealthy like this is this is bedrock in animal nutrition science there is no debate about oh well maybe cows should eat meat or maybe you know uh maybe i don't know sheep maybe that we should feed them just nothing but grain it, it's well known how 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 are we so confused in human nutrition but yet it's so clear in animal nutrition, exactly down to the micromole, what to feed them to optimize the health of that animal. How is that possible? Well, um, I do like to point out that swine nutritionists have been balancing their rations for growing pigs on an individual indispensable amino acid basis for four decades or more. Um, not so much with human nutrition. The irony, of course, is that swine are used as a model for humans in determining the digestibility of indispensable amino acids. Um, I've sat in meetings of meat scientists and listened to a really uh, compelling presentation about this subject of indispensable amino acids and had 
uh, someone who apparently was one of his classmates, right? But that was 40 years ago or whatever. And he's saying, you know, Professor so-and-so tried to teach us this 40 years ago. What is it? And again, human nutrition is not a functional scientific discipline True. when it's informed by this nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease or other belief systems and worldviews that get in the way. You know, I, I remember a, a, a meeting I had gotten Adele Height to attend some of my forage conferences. And at one of them, I was giving the pitch and I was saying, you know, those of us involved in plant nutrition, soil fertility, animal nutrition, we're used to doing studies under really controlled conditions. And we don't necessarily think about how human nutritionists can't do those. And then I went off on this riff about how it's really hard to find large groups of genetically similar human beings that you can completely control for long periods of time, know exactly what they're eating and analyze it, right? So you know exactly what they're eating. And then Adele spoke up from the audience and said, and sacrifice them at the end of the study to determine body composition. Yep. We call that a production cycle. <laughs> Right. Dairymen at least twice a day have the truck come and haul away milk. If that changes dramatically, then they start looking for what just happened. And consulting nutritionists, consulting veterinarians get fired every single day. And like I say, on the way out the door, the winning strategy is not to blame the cow. Right. <laughs> right. right. So, but we don't have that going on in humans for any number of reasons. So it's just... I think it's important for us to let people know that there's information available. You know, I, I, I like to think people are trying to make informed decisions. I think that they haven't gotten the information they need to really make a truly informed decision in many cases. And so yes. they're going, you know, off of what they've heard from some news story or magazine article or or whatever. And so how can we get better at saying, yeah, well, you know, there's, have you thought about this? You know, have you, have you seen the report from the FAO that was just released within the last few months that said the least impactful choice you, that uh, approach to reducing animal agriculture's global impact is dietary choices. The least, you know, and then I see somebody else report that 20% of the meat that's produced every year is lost because of animal disease, right? So here we have animals that are, you know, they're eating, they're occupying space, drinking water, emitting whatever, and we never get the benefit of the meat from those animals because they're lost to disease. So that they're still contributing to our the footprint. So if you could you know, reduce that burden of disease for the animals. And that's something that can be done. We know a lot about that. There's a lot of other things involved, but globally, because half of the world's cattle exist in Asia and Africa, half. Three quarters of the sheep in the world exist in Africa and Asia, and almost all like 95 plus percent of the world's goats exist in Africa and Asia. So whatever people are entertaining in the high income Western countries, it's not, it's going to have impacts, but we're not looking to those parts of the world where these impacts will be greatest, where people often are poor where often uh, I remember Dr. Ede talking years ago about how 95% of the world's vegetarians are economic vegetarians. Yes. They're not philosophical vegetarians. Yeah. Not by choice, but by they, it's either that or starve to death. It, 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 you know, lack of availability, lack of access. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, all of those are issues beyond merely looking at agricultural issues, which is why we need to look at it. The, the irony as I see it, though, I don't know, irony is the right word. Malnutrition is widespread across all income level countries. Yes. It looks different depending on where you are, right? So we are seeing evidence of malnutrition in high, medium, and low income countries. And the rate of it, of course, is going to change. Um, 
depending on where you are. But when you've got a fifth of women of childbearing age in the U.S. that are anemic, uh, when you've got something, at least a fifth of adults in America not meeting their essential amino acid requirements, and that's a low estimate, um, it's clearly across. So we, we need to we need to confront some of the mindsets that say, oh, obesity is the result of overnutrition. That's the freight. You can see that used in some literature. Right. You know, clearly, they're eating too much. They're not exercising enough, uh, which you think about the living conditions of some people. And they're, they're hauling water at eight pounds per gallon for two miles one way. Talk to me about yeah, he's, um, there, part of this is a lot of this is not well enough considered. Right. They say things without really thinking them through. <clears throat> like when they say, you know, we have too many people, you know, like we need to control, we need to control population growth, not understanding that the growth in the number of people between now and 2100 is going to be people getting to live to be 60, 70 and 80 in Africa and Southwest Asia. So what are you really saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how, how do you propose to, to slow that growth? There's only one yeah, way exactly. to do that that I know of. <clears throat> and and I'm... I, I, I'm, I'm willing to believe that they don't mean that until I see, you know, compelling evidence to the contrary. They just don't think these things through. Um, when we have, you know, that the, the WHO itself says that the best source of the nutri nutrients children require for development from six months to 23 months of age is meat, eggs, dairy, seafood. UNICEF says that 60, 60 percent of children globally between six months and 23 months of age do not get meat, eggs, dairy, seafood in their diet. Yeah. And there's actually a great study that was done from in the countries that you're talking about where just adding one egg a day to their enforced veg vegan diet, vegetarian diet, because that's all they can afford. That's all they have access to. That IQ went up. School performance went up just from one egg a day. And so I, I think that we probably all agree that the, the current nutritional recommendations that you minimize red meat, you minimize eggs, you eat more plants uh, for your health and for the health of the planet. This is I think this is a temporary fad. But the problem is, is that it's a fad in the kind of the ivory towers, uh, people with PhDs and MDs, people with money. They believe this and they're promoting this. And this is completely unsustainable. Uh, I, you and I both know there's never been a single instance of a successful vegan culture or empire lasting for any period of time. It's just it's just it's humanly impossible mm -hmm. to live on a vegan diet. Now, with with all with, you know, modern society, we've got supplements, we've got refrigeration, we've got all this. But I would I would love to take the the most vocal vegan and say, you know, I love your I love your your wherewithal. I love your ethics and your morals. We're going to take you and we're going to drop you in this country where there's no refrigeration. There's no supplement store. Where, where, where should we drop them, Dr. Ballerstadt? What country should we drop them in and say, OK, now enjoy the benefits of your vegan diet? Well, you don't have to drop them anywhere. Just take, you know, just say, okay, you're not going to have these things. You're not going to be able to access these, but you could, you know, imagine places in equatorial Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the problem there, of course, is that there are animal source foods available. So you have to watch them because, you know, that you, know, <laughs> right, the, you, you got too many closet bacon eaters out there. Yeah, um, uh, you know, it's the gateway meat. Um, so yes, unfortunately, we also have those people in a, in positions to influence where funding can go. And so the work that needs to be done to improve the productivity and efficiency of ruminant animal agriculture globally is inhibited because we have people that believe this. At the same time, we have people doing really good work on, you know, sustainable food systems or what have you. And they believe things like 
obesity is the result of overnutrition. So yep. th this, this contamination is very widespread. It may be a fad, but it's been with us for over half a century. So it, it's like well past time for it to be exercised. I, totally I think, agree. It, you know, at the same time, there's really, really good news. And when you start looking at the burden of metabolic diseases, when you look at all of the diseases that are part of this constellation, and you realize the burden that that's placing on society. You know, if, if we're ever going to talk seriously about sustainability, and I know people doing good, serious work in that space, they look at buckets of issues and they tend to go societal, economic, as well as environmental. And environmental includes many more things than merely looking at, at, at uh, e you know, emissions. Um, so let's start, you know, what is the financial burden of the chronic disease pandemic that humanity is experiencing globally? This is across all income level countries. And clearly there are some, you know, the, the, the impact is going to manifest differently. But when you've got every 30 seconds, someone in the world losing a lower leg due to diabetes. OK, um, when you're talking about, you know, trillions of dollars of expense by 2030 because of the current model of healthcare for chronic disease, which is the large, it's the biggest killer globally is chronic, not infectious. And we're not good at the chronic disease care. We're really good at the trauma. And I'm very grateful for it. You know, I'm very yeah. grateful for the infectious disease advancements that have been made. Uh, all of that. Um, I think that if we could have an honest, humble conversation about how, frankly, you suck at the chronic disease treatment. Um, so, so what, you know, we have this massive economic burden. Um, we have the societal burden of people's lives being diminished, shortened, um, you know, less active than they could be in the raising of their children or grandchildren, less productive as workers. You know, we've got between a fifth and a quarter of children under five years old globally being stunted because they're not getting the animal source food provided nutrients they need for their brains to develop properly. And so these people then can't become as productive as they could. And so one estimate is that that could be as much as an 11% GDP drag in sub-Saharan Africa. At the same time, 20% of the world's cattle exist in sub-Saharan Africa. There are more cattle in Ethiopia than people, but they're not commercialized for any number of reasons. It's very complicated. But again, until people catch the image that what we really need is what I've called a ruminant revolution. We need people to understand that we're not going to have sustainable food systems without these animals. Um, one of the things that people frequently will say is, look at how many more soybeans we could grow if we weren't grazing all that land with cattle. And they may not be aware of the fact you can't grow soybeans everywhere, quite right. apart from whether we should be eating them, but that's a different thing. Yeah. Um, so the vast majority of agricultural land in the world is not suitable for crop production. Yes. And, and what it is ideally suited for is growing grass and having grazing animals convert yep. that into high value products for human use. Yep. Most of the world's croplands used to be grasslands. And so the native grasslands of the world are the most endangered biomes in the world. Even in Brazil, there are two types, tropical and subtropical, um, and these are far more endangered than the rainforest yes. is. And some I'll biomes the, have, go ahead, Peter. Go some ahead. biomes seem to have better PR firms than others. So I don't. <laughs> Definitely. So Peter actually came to our farm uh, several years ago uh, to visit. And uh, do you remember the condition of my soil? And Peter taught me something then that I had no idea. He said that it's, it's just standard in Tennessee and Kentucky, Alabama, Mississippi, 
uh, all the kind of uh, the, the eastern states of the United States that basically what the settlers would do is they would come in, they would cut down all the trees, burn the trees, pull the stumps up or burn the stumps, and then they would farm it for a few years. And, and they did not know, I, I guess they didn't know, that you cannot farm on a slope for very many years or there will be no soil left. And Peter, he's, he, he bent down and he, he dug in my dirt a little bit and he's like, yeah, this has been farmed to death. The, you literally have a, a quarter inch of real meaningful topsoil here. It's going to take you years to have any meaningful soil on this farm, which I agree with. And so uh, P, I, Peter and I have talked about this. I, for the last two years, I've been uh, rotation grazing my my flock of sheep on this and so i'll have them on each paddock for about two or three days and then they move to the next paddock and give that paddock anywhere from 12 to 20 days of rest after the grazing uh, insult and and so i've been doing that for two years now and i can tell that my soil is holding more water i can tell that i've got more just uh humus on the ground dead stuff. I've got lots of sheep urine and poop on the ground now. And I'm, I've just, I just today ordered uh, uh, some, some dung beetles, Dr. Fowlerstadt, <laughs> because I, I, cause I've been doing this for two years and there's literally sheep poop from two years ago, still laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that I, I've nothing's, nothing's here to do that. And I got to thinking, well, you would think tumble bugs, that's what we call them here in Tennessee, tumble bugs. You would think dung beetles would come. But then I got to thinking it's literally probably three miles to the nearest person who has any meaningful number of cattle or sheep or any other where, where dung beetles could actually make a living. Everything mm -hmm. here is soybeans. Everything here is corn. And so I'm, I actually had to order dung beetles. You can do that. There's a company yes, in yes. Texas that sells them. And so they're going to be arriving in a few weeks and I'll do a video about re releasing my dung beetles onto OB Farms. But th there's nothing here to eat the poop and to actually get it back into the soil other than microorganisms. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't know of any way to do it faster because this, this farm has literally been monocropped to death with corn mm -hmm. and soybeans and, and who knows what else. But nobody knew better back then. And so many, many farmers are left with a farm. We've got 50 acres here. And, and as you were alluding to earlier, out of that 50 acres, there's probably five acres that you could traditionally farm for corn or soybeans. The rest of it, you would be an idiot because it's all rolling hills, right? Mm -hmm. And so my, my quarter inch of topsoil, if you tried to farm that, you'd get one or two seasons and then you would it would just it would look like uh, grease. There would be nothing left but rocks. And and, well, and yeah. So we 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 have uh, certainly in the southeast. It's the oldest area. You know, well, the eastern seaboard. Yeah. Um. And and because of the nature of the soils, the topography, they were growing. You know, in addition to corn, soybeans, relatively recent, but. Clearly, cotton was a big one. Tobacco was cotton, another one. Um, corn became big in the South because they couldn't grow other grains. Um, and, and, and so I, I keep looking for explanation, people that can teach me about the, the, the history of agriculture. And so somebody shows me that, you know, the, the Ohio Valley was where we started with the feedlotting of cattle, where they would grow the corn, shock the corn, because otherwise they, they, they started with the cattle in barns. For the winter time and then you'd have to feed them then you'd have to haul the manure out and somebody figured oh look if we shock the corn leave it in the field then control the access of the animals to that then the fertility stays in the field and even though they were in ohio there were no roads to the eastern so they had to like if they were going to ship corn they had to ship it down the ohio to the mississippi and then down okay or they could walk, feed it to cattle and walk it to market. Right. And so that's where they started doing that. Um, yeah, the, the, the issues of soil degradation due to depletion and erosion in the Southeast were huge. 
in the 30s. You can go back into the Soil Conservation Service literature and find stuff. So there's a lot of really good stuff for us to go back to. The problem, of course, is, you know, what, what kind of farm could be an economic unit on 50 acres, right? It, it's very difficult. Um, the average cow calf so herd size is probably in the 30 cow range in your state. Yep. It's, you know, just a little below 50, I think in the whole United States. Um, but if, you know, if you want local food, buy beef because we've got cattle in every state of the union. Um, and, and the, the key thing that they do is this upcycling of this resource. So, in, you know, grasses evolved under the pressure of fire and or grazing, herbivory. And, and so we, we had the grasses, I, I think I remember this right, there's evidence of grass pollen going back almost 60 million years. Um, and then somewhere in that 40 million, maybe plus or minus time, we start to see the ancestors of the ruminants evolve. And then, of course, we can come forward to human beings, the clever little hominid that started out as a, as a, a, a scavenger. What were they scavenging? The results of a kill of a ruminant, primarily mm -hmm. grasslands, the savannas. And over time, you know, hey, presto, here we are. Um Still today, over half of the food that's produced is dependent on livestock manure for fertilizer. Over half of the world's farmers still depend on draft animals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're a critical part and they're thir there's no plant agriculture without animal agriculture. They're completely integrated, looks different in different parts of the world. But the really cool things that I'm seeing in some parts of the world is this bringing livestock back into cropping systems. And so the one example that I just talk about every chance I get is in southern Brazil, which would yeah. be, you know, like northern <clears throat> Florida kind of temperate the temperature they grow soybeans in fact soybeans are such a profitable crop and this is a problem that the landowners who own native pampa the native grassland of southern brazil and uruguay uh, argentina they someone will come and pay them rent to grow soybeans on their land they'll do all the farming just to pay them rent they'll pay them five times more in rent than what the owner could make growing beef from that same land on native grassland. So there's just tremendous pressure economically, you know, and if they don't make, you know, there's no sustainability without profit, right, at some point. So, but what they've done, okay, in these great, uh, the, there are a lot of, the, I've been introduced to this community of researchers and they're helping growers do this where, okay, the soybeans is the cash crop. So the traditional model was that's where the inputs are going to go. Somebody mm. said, well, what if we move the fertilizer from the soybeans? Uh, and so what they would do, sorry, is, is they would grow the soybeans and then close to harvest, they would plant a winter annual grass, which they would then graze with their weaned cattle. And then they'd go back to soybeans the, the next spring. <clears throat> so instead of putting the fertilizer on the soybeans, they put it on the forage. And not surprisingly, they grew more forage. Good. That, you know, that worked. Okay, good. And then because they had more forage, they could grow more beef. Good. Okay, that all makes sense. What was surprising was they got the same soybean yield. Because 90% of the nutrients that the cows are consuming goes back onto the land. And so now, and then the other thing that they're documenting is the in benefits to the soil from having that more vigorous grass stand and cover the soil during that non-growing season. And, and then also grazing animals seem to be a key part of this as well as boosting this benefit. So all of this, you're getting this, you're getting more food from the same area with the same input plus a benefit. 
And we need to find those kinds of things globally. And we can. But again, if we have this worldview, this, this mindset that says, oh, you need to eat less animal source food. <clears throat> and, you know, there's this. And, and, and so when people think about, well, wait a minute now, we're grazing animals on the same land that we're producing crops in in a year. Well, we, we, there are other examples of that. So when people start talking about land use, do they always account for that? No, typically not. They misstate water use. They misstate the emissions. They talk about a feed food competition when there is none. Um, and so the most important thing for people, I think, general people, is to understand that there's really good news if you've got obesity or diabetes or mental health issues or any number of these conditions that I get to hear about from people like you and, and the others that we get to listen to. And don't worry about what these people say. They're the same people that sold you the diet that made you sick in the first place. So Absolutely. don't listen to them. You don't have to. Just they'll we'll, we'll get that sorted. But meanwhile, focus on what you can do to improve the world by improving your own health. Yes. And improving your local community and improving the health of your family and your neighbors. That's exactly what I'm all about. Recently, I attended a grazing uh, school in Missouri. Uh, Greg Judy was uh, holding a regenerative ranching grazing school. And so I consider myself not to be a sheep rancher. I consider myself to be a dirt and grass farmer because mm -hmm. I am 100% like you wouldn't believe uh, how fed up Misha is hearing me talk about grass. Uh, the other day, yes, we, I would. Were driving, <laughs> we were driving down the road and Beckett, Beckett and Bonnie are in the back seat, Peter. And Beckett says, look at all those yellow flowers over in that pasture. That means it's not good dirt, doesn't it, Daddy? <laughs> He's four, four years old. And I'm nice. like, yes, son, it means good, good. that that is very good. poor school. Yes, it's been over. So, so my, my version slightly different, but along the same sort of lines, is I, got, I found myself a few years ago with two of my mentors from the forage, you know, extension world in the car. I mean, these are big guys in, in the, the realm and uh, riding around in a pickup truck. And there was a colleague that was driving us through Mississippi and Alabama. I sort of felt like, you know, here I'd woken up in my oral defense and I hadn't studied. <laughs> um, and, and sure, I had to say something wrong that they both got me for. So, okay, we got that out of the way. Um, but I said, you know, these people have been all around the world, literally all around the world and, and all across the country. And I, I said, have you ever been anywhere with the possible exception of New Zealand where you didn't find yourself looking at the land you were driving by and go, look at the potential. And, you know, we had an interesting conversation about that. And there's lots of reasons why we're where we where we are today. That was not easy to say. And it we need to understand those. You know, a colleague of mine says, if if you've got an answer that nobody's using, you might want to look at that. Right? There might be a really good reason, and it might be a good answer. But if we don't find a way for people to adopt that, you know, so um, but we do have, so when people say things about we can't feed the world this kind of diet, we can't feed the world as much meat as we eat. And, you know, it's like, well, as you know, we're not the biggest meat eaters in the world. Um, number two is I want to change that immediately. And I want to say, no, we must. Yes, It's a moral imperative for us to find a way to provide humanity the quality diet that they need to an order <clears throat> to meet their potential and to yes. flourish. Yes. So, so, and again, the words we use kind of mean things. So if we can shift that conversation, maybe we can increase the awareness of why that's so critical. It's a human right. 
Yeah. And just because we, you know, just because our ancestors came across early enough for us to be here and have these advantages for us to now turn around and look at the rest of the world that would really like, you know, 45% of humanity consumes less electrical power per year than a large North American refrigerator. Yep. A thousand kilowatt hours, which means they have nothing that I take for granted. Right. We were struggling with technology that people would really like to have the opportunity to get. You know, these people are living in Chicago circa 1900. And they would really, really like to get a little closer to 2024. Yep. And, and so all of those things, as well as these, these falsehoods that people tell, and those falsehoods hurt people. Yes. And, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that they don't intentionally do that, but we need to find ways to help them understand that, you know, you, you, so the, the, these were things I kind of fumbled with in Las Vegas, but it, it, there's, there's some researchers who suggest that when a population is consuming less than 30% of the calories in its diet from animal source foods, then you see multiple rapidly increasing deficiencies of micronutrients. The U.S. is at 29%. Okay. Um, not surprising that we're seeing so much, you know, what, what if all of these conditions in a country where these are so affordable and so available. And, and yet, you know, so how do we get people to, to see? And part of that is for people who have had a personal health experience like you have, like I have, to communicate that appropriately in our little communities whatever those are, so that other people will have those personal experiences, so that more and more. And, and what I talked about in, in Las Vegas was, yes, we need people doing the science and getting that published and out. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need people who are trying to change policy, right, and get that done. That's necessary, but it won't be sufficient. And, and I also think that a, you should pardon the expression, grassroots movement from the ground up is one that will make that policy change more successful because there'll be more support for it. Yep. And, and somewhere along the line, we're going to run into the right people that are connected in the right place. You know, and it's sort of like when you look at Charlie Foundation or Bazooki Group, these these people who have resources and connections that as a result of their personal experiences, they can launch these things that then help so many, many more people. And I'm just a forage agronomist, right? I, I, I read Gary Taubes. I got pissed off um, because of what I saw had been done to demonize the industries I was trained to um support. Then I get a little pissed off because I'm reading stuff that kind of is repeating some of the nonsense that I know to be nonsense from my training. Well, okay, you can only know so much and he knows a lot, but he can't know everything. So right. how can I <clears throat> help? So that's what I've been trying to do. And I think there's opportunities for all of us to kind of contribute in that space. Yep. One thing I noticed at the grazing school and it was a kind of an uh, unspoken feeling of guilt. There were probably half cattle ranchers, half sheep ranchers there for the grazing school. And I was talking to people, introducing myself, and it, there was this underlying tone of guilt. Like, well, my dad started this ranch, and, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I love beef and I love to eat it, but I don't know. Maybe I should get out of it. And I wound up with Greg's permission standing up on the last day of the conference and uh, chastising every rancher in the room saying, I need you guys to stop acting like beef and bacon and butter and eggs are some kind of guilty pleasure that, oh, yeah, you know, I make a living at this, but I'm not real proud of it. I'm like, you guys are raising literally the ultimate food for humanity. 
You guys are literally feeding people the healthiest food you could possibly feed them. I need to, you to stop the guilt and stop the apologetics like, well, you know, I mean, and, and so at the end of it, I got almost a standing ovation because I feel like that they all breathe the sigh of relief. Like, oh, so, so beef and bacon is actually good for people. I'm not, I'm not causing people to have heart attacks mm-hmm. by raising beef and bacon and eggs and butter. I'm like, no, you're literally improving the health of humanity by doing what you do. Please don't stop doing it and please do more of it. But yeah. have you seen that that similar, like uh, almost like it's a guilty pleasure? Like, you know, I don't take any pride in, in selling beef into the market. I'm just doing it because I'm, you know, it's a family business. Have you seen that kind of attitude? Well, I think the phrase is Stockholm syndrome. Right. Um, and, and years ago there, and I have still have the picture at, at the, I think it was the Boise airport. There was this ad that was put out by the beef councils. And so it was funded with, you know, check off dollars. Um, and you know, 29 lean cuts of beef. And, and I do remember sitting, uh, I, I gave a presentation at an event that was held along with a beef conference that was there in Kentucky and a really well-meaning, really energetic young person who was doing this work. And, you know, she very proudly showed this, this spot that had been on TV and her line was as close as I can remember to make, you know, lean beef an even healthier part of your health, heart healthy diet Buy the 95, seven ground beef, brown it, put it in a colander, and pour boiling water over it to drain even more fat away. Well, okay, that came from somewhere. Someone told these people this, right? And 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 so yes, I've seen it. I, I you know that that guilt that you described. Um, I've also seen it when I basically channel Gary Taubes or you or someone else at one of these meetings, and when I get done. And I say, if anything I just told you is new information, why did it have to be a forage agronomist that gave it to you? You know, how many times have I heard somebody come up to me and say, well, my doctor's really on me about my my um, cholesterol. And I'm like, OK, what what numbers? Well, I don't know. You know, so so it's like we're, that all they know is they've got high cholesterol, let alone what that means. They don't know what the numbers are. OK, there's that. But I'm also seeing a growing amount of a number of people who are like, yeah, this is what happened to me. And oh, by the way, I found this doctor who's completely said everything you said. And so so it's growing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, mm-hmm. also, you know, a lot of a lot of not everyone in agriculture wants to deal with the public. You know, they'd like to, you know, kind of live behind the gate and, you know, you do you and I'll do me and mine and it's all good. Um, but when you get this, you know, the, the, it, it's, it's not quite <laughs> um, uh, uh, a stretch to talk about, you know, the, the ranch, the, the daughter who grew up on a ranch and went away to college and comes home for Thanksgiving. And I'm a vegan now because of, you know, there's all of these societal pressures that had come against them. And, and so to a certain extent, you know, doctors that they think a lot of, on the other hand, um, a, a friend of mine, um, I'd like to consider him a friend. He's certainly a colleague, John Madney from, um, from Dillon, Montana, came to the, um, the International Grasslands Congress that was in uh, northern Kentucky last spring. And he gave a paper on, I think it's like uh, applying the principles of animal, um, animal husbandry to human medicine or something like that. And he wow. talked about, he talked about fa- foundered people. Yep. And that audience got that reference. <laughs> Right. So um, over over time, you know, finding ways to help these audiences hear this. At the same time, I see people within various communities who are kind of saying, well, we know red meat's bad for us, but if I produce it this way, it's less bad. So I'm going to promote the heck out of this red meat or whatever. 
And, right. and the, the danger that I see there is it starts building roadblocks to adoption for people that are economically challenged. And I've yeah. heard people say, if you're not going to buy X, Y, you know, panda massage is a phrase I've heard somebody use, uh, watered with unicorn tears, you know, that if you're not going to get all that, then don't even try. Right. And my version of that is when I gave one of these presentations and a gentleman that I've known for decades, think the world of him as far as a grazing dairy, all that, but he's part of the organic industry. And he said from the audience, if you're not going to get somebody to go 100% organic, you might as well leave them on the standard American diet. Well, now we know we're not dealing with any kind of scientific evidence. This is belief right. system. This is right. narrative from his <clears throat> perspective. Yeah. So I have grown tired of all of the people from various audiences talking about how nutrient dense their product is versus some other product, similar product produced a different way. And I try to say, you know, that's got a definition, right? <laughs> and and <clears throat> do you know, have you thought through this? Like, if, if you've got more magnesium in your wheat than some other wheat, how important is that when we're feeding an insulin resistant population with 93% of the population being, you know, not having optimal cardiometabolic health? Maybe that doesn't matter, you know, yeah. um, and, and mm -hmm. in, in Las Vegas, I, I had to throw up that the, sorry, put on the screen, that the um, dietary guidelines have an official diet definition for nutrient dense. And it's explicitly low fat, whether that's added or naturally occurring. <clears throat> and then they gave examples of typical food versus a nutrient dense version, a better choice. And so one was frosted mini wheats was the typical and the better nutrient dense version would be unfrosted mini wheats and that butter was the typical and i would like to know what the percentage of people eating butter is versus margarine but they had butter and then they said the better choice would be vegetable oil oh. and then the last one of the five that i talked about was that soda was typical Sorry, pop is that um, versus sparkling mineral water? Yeah, because be water nutrient, nutrient dense. Yeah. yeah, 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 nutrient dense. And so, if you don't understand the definitions other people are using for the terms that they're using, you might think you agree with these people, and I mm -hmm. don't. I don't and either. So we, yeah. One thing that I've heard a lot of people talk about, and you and I have discussed this before, is. Uh, oh, this is grass finished. Uh, this is grass fed beef. I want you, uh, knowing what you know, let's let's say that I just bought five pounds of the cheapest beef from the cheapest discount grocery store. Okay, this is the cheapest beef you can buy in the United States. Now, People in their head, because of, of all the baloney that you were just spouting that, that other people say, would be like, oh, don't eat that. That's, that's grain fed. That's no good. Walk us through the life cycle of that cow that wound up being the cheapest cut of ground beef in the cheapest discount supermarket that you could possibly find. What percentage of that cow's life did they spend grazing on grass? What percentage of the time did they spend eating in a feedlot? What were they eating in the feedlot? How much of what they were eating in the feedlot could humans actually eat and benefit from? And then when that winds up in the supermarket, how nutritionally different is that than the grass-fed, grass-finished, panda massage, watered with unicorn tears, that's $28 a pound? So... It I'm going to assume that the hamburger comes from a commercial steer. Yes. Because a lot of hamburger comes from old cow and it would be different. Um, but okay, let's assume we have a steer. So for the first five to six months of its life, it's going to be running on pasture with mama, um, you know, nursing for the first part of that. And then slowly, you know, we get toward weaning at five to six months. Then those animals typically go onto better quality pasture so that they can grow a couple hundred more pounds before they end up in a feedlot situation. 
Um, those animals, even in a feedlot, are still going to be getting a great deal of forage in their ration. It tends to the, the forage to concentrate ratio, the forage declines as they get further into this process. So they may spend five months in a feedlot. And so by 22 months or so, they're going to be harvested. So that's yes. the whole lifespan. Uh, in the U.S., a commercial steer, about 10% of its lifetime feed is human edible. Okay. Now, we're not counting the milk that mama gives because we're not milking those animals. Right. So um, 90% of the, the, the food that is fed to this steer that winds up on the supermarket shelf, only 10% of it is even edible by humans. So even right. in the feedlot, you said you said forage versus concentrate. Break that down to, to layman's terms. What is the forage and what is the concentrate? So you would likely see alfalfa hay. You would likely see some corn which humans silage. Can't eat. Which humans yeah, can't exactly eat. right. Yes. And 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 yes, the silage, depending on the stage of maturity, is going to have some corn kernels in it. Um, you know, when we talk about 10%, that's primarily corn in the United States, but it could be any number of other uh, grains, depending on where you are in the country. Um, but the cows are could... also eating the stalk and the leaves, correct? And exactly. Yeah, and you exactly. can't eat any of that. No. So if I grow a crop of corn, if I grow a crop of wheat, over half of the biomass that I'm growing for that crop is not human edible. Yes, so, so, you know, we'll find cattle grazing corn stalks. Um, in, in California, we have the almond industry. A lot of almond hulls are produced as a byproduct. My line is you can't get milk from almonds, but you can get it from almond hulls because they feed those hulls to the dairy cattle in California. It's a big resource for them to use. You can find all kinds of these byproducts. You know, some of the lots in the Pacific Northwest, they feed potato waste, right? So all of these byproducts in, uh, there was one study in Germany or the, 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 researcher is from Munich and they were saying for every kilo of vegan food, four to five kilos of inedible biomass are produced. So basically agriculture is the story of mankind modifying its environment wherever, wherever it exists yep. to increase the production of biomass. And the yep. vast majority of that biomass is not human edible. So, okay, we've talked about 10% for a commercial steer's lifetime feed being potentially human edible. Again, just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? Right. So, um, okay, but then globally for all of the domesticated ruminants, globally, it's 4% is human edible. 96% not edible by humans at all. And Correct. we're talking about the cheapest feedlot beef you can buy. Right. The, the 90, somewhere between 90 and 96 percent of what that cow ate in its entire life is not edible by humans. Correct. But 100 so, percent of the cow is edible by humans, except for the contents of the bladder, gallbladder and, and the <laughs> intestine. Yeah. You know, macking on the hide is probably not big on my lips. Right. Still um, better than eating uh, corn, corn salt. <laughs> probably so. Um, so. So those issues, um, of course, what we have to recognize is the U.S. in many parts has this thing called winter. Yes. And so, so cattle can't always be on pasture. Um, so even in the cow-calf sort of, you'll, you'll move those animals out of higher country to lower country, but they're still going to be in a lot so that you can feed them more easily so they're protected from the environment. Um, but the, the, you know, you, you have a cow calf ranch, it can't support both the cows, the now pregnant cows, as well as last year's crop of calves, they have to go somewhere else. And so they, you know, we, we have animals moving around the country to take advantage of the, the climate in different places, the resources that are available there. Um, so yes, we can measure minute differences 
in yeah. contents of various nutrients. Yeah. Now let's where, talk about the difference between that cheap, cheap beef, nutritionally speaking, for human beings. This is the cheapest beef you could possibly buy in the supermarket versus the grass-fed, grass-finished Panda Massage, $28 a pound ground beef from this micro regenerative ranch, did everything perfectly right. What's the nutritional difference between a pound of this cheap beef and a pound of this $28, $30 a pound ground beef? I don't think it's a meaningful difference. I agree. Uh, I, I, I think there are quantitative differences, undeniably. I think that then jumping to the biological significance of those differences is a leap beyond any data that we have. A lot of the stories that lead people there, I could deconstruct as well as I've talked about other things. Um, I, I think that, you know, for 80 percent of the population, you know, going to the to Piggly Wiggly and buying the cheap 80-20 hamburger and the lost leader eggs and the uh, store brand butter, right? And and whatever, you know, that that if if you ate that and you got a little more active as you felt up to it and you got out in the sun some more and maybe lift something heavy every once in a while, I think that would make a meaningful, a a, a far more meaningful impact. You know, so one of my lines is the problem isn't the grain fed cattle, it's the grain fed people. A hundred percent agree. hundred percent agree. Do you mind if we take some questions from the audience? Oh, I don't mind at all. Okay. We got a good one here from Beyond Pavement. Have there been any studies on wild animals passing gas compared to domestic <laughs> and mankind? So uh, to my understanding, there used to be 60 to 80 million head of bison and a bison is much, much larger than a domestic cow, did they not also burp and fart? And did that not contribute to global warming back then? Also, not to mention all the other megafauna that used to live in North America before 10,000 years ago. Did they not burp and fart? How, how were their farts magical, Dr. Ballersnack? Yeah, so apparently the, the reason for the hump on the bison was that's where the, the methane was stored. And so they, you know, Buffalo didn't, you know, so, okay, first of all, yes, it, it's not the farts, it's the belches from ruminants. Right. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the point is that a normal part of the ruminant digestion is the emission of methane. That's part of the normal carbon cycling. So uh, Manzano and colleagues, I forget when, I think it was last spring, may have been a year ago last spring, released a paper saying that there were comparable greenhouse gas emissions from wildlife dominated savannas and livestock dominated savannas. We have been having conversations that artificially restrict things to only those emissions and only those things that man does. And so, you know, the, the, this idea is, yes, you know, if grassland is going to remain grassland, it has to be grazed or burnt. I think it's better to graze it. Um, in some cases, it still needs to be burnt. There's the prairie naturally still in place prairie in uh, the, the Flint Hills area where they have to burn periodically yep. to keep woody species from coming in, even though they're practicing all this great grazing management. So um, yes, there have been studies. Yes, there are other animals that emit methane. Um, and we've been having these sort of artificially constrained conversations that people aren't aware of all the nuance about. Yes. And we're not even going to talk about the methane emissions of the average vegan, because if anybody's <laughs> ever lived with a vegan, there is some methane being emitted there. Now, Powell has got a question, but are the cows eating the remaining pesticides from the previous soy crop? Now, what I want you to, uh, how, how I want you to answer this question is talk about pesticides residues. How do ruminant animals cope with that? Are there pesticides stored in their in their flesh, in their fat? And then what about all the antibiotics that we're giving all the animals in the feedlot? Is that not stored in the meat? Are we not eating antibiotics and eating uh, glyphosate when we eat uh, beef and sheep? So uh, the short answer is I am not concerned about these topics and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, <clears throat> One one of the things that 
I remember my first classes in agriculture, and I grew up in suburban Philadelphia, so I, it, it was all new to me. The first question I asked was, they were talking about fertilizing corn, and they were going to make a two, in, they called it two by two, two inches over, two inches down from where the seed was planted, right? That, that they were going to put this band of liquid nitrogen as a side dress to corn. And I was like, but won't that freeze the roots? And he's like, uh, no, Pete, not liquid nitrogen. This is a nitrogen solution, Pete. Right. So, okay, I get it. Um, that a lot of these organic compounds that are called pesticides, rightly so, are food for microbes. They are degraded by the soil microbiology. Same thing happens in the rumen. We have these animals or organisms that live and, and can degrade a, the, the, these compounds that get into that environment. It's also important to recognize what the relative exposure is. It's low. Um, and, and then at the end, there are surveillance protocols in place for testing meat, and organs, and and that data is published every year. So this is part of USDA inspection. Um, and the same thing happens with milk, and the same thing happens with commodities, and and it also includes antibiotics. And so you know, if if there when antibiotics are used, there is a withholding period where that animal should not enter into the food channel. And if it does, and it's discovered, it's traced back, and then people are in trouble. Yes. Uh, basically, every tank, every tank load of milk is tested. They have rapid response tests that then they can go more specific if they're in. And if it's if it's um, shown to be positive for these, so, so okay, there's that. Um, antibiotic use is a tricky thing. Um, uh, people like to talk, oh, look at how much is used. Well, we're treating a 1200 pound animal, right? It, it, it takes more <laughs> to treat one of them. Or, you know, if you've got however many millions of chickens, I mean, there's like 90 million cow. Uh, no, it, what is it? There are more horse, there are almost as many horses in the United States as there are dairy cows. Interesting. And it's interesting that everybody talks about the dairy cows without mentioning the horses, mostly because it might mm -hmm. hurt their fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, and and so the the compounds that are being used in agriculture today are less toxic than they were in the '60s. And one other thing I just point out to people is that organic agriculture doesn't mean without pesticide. It means that the pesticides that they used have been approved by some labeling organization. And in some cases, so for example, copper sulfate was a really common and long time um, thing used, especially in horticulture, um, great production and things. And, and the long-term use of that has created problems with copper toxicity in soils. It does not, you know, no, no microorganism is going to chew up copper. <laughs> so um, it just, I'm not concerned. I understand that people are uh, or can be. And if, you know, they, they have the ability to afford and the access to it, by all means, we know what we need to be eating. And yeah, whatever is. Now, I always say, if you can afford the the expensive panda massage beef, then please, by all means, buy that because I really want people with means, with money, I want them to stimulate the growth mm. of regenerative agriculture. Absolutely, but if all you can afford is the cheapest supermarket discount grocery beef, that is still orders of magnitude healthier for you than eating the wheat, rice, oats, and corn. And if you really well, want also, to up your glyphosate intake, eat more oats. Yeah, yeah, That's where yeah. you're going to get well, glyphosate. And, it, you know, just because you're buying it at a supermarket doesn't mean it wasn't raised under regenerative principles, right? Because these right. are not new principles. These are principles that many people have been practicing for a very long time. Absolutely. The, the title is relatively recent. 
okay, and the awareness is recent, but so all of those things, you know, inform what I encourage people to, you know, um, what's affordable, what's available, what's appropriate to you. So, you know, red meat is an animal source food. Not all red meat is beef <laughs> and not all animal source food is meat. Right. Yep. So my, my definition of a vegetarian is an omnivore that doesn't eat red meat for whatever reason. Right. And a vegan is someone that doesn't eat any animal source food and a Carnivore is somebody that doesn't eat any plant source food. Okay, so most of us are going to end up being somewhere in that omnivore spectrum. Yep. And let's make sure that people understand that you're not likely to be meeting your micronutrient and essential protein uh, amino acid requirements if you exclude too much animal source food from your diet. So whatever that level is for you, whatever your targets are, whatever your choices are, act accordingly. But we need to have that sort of foundational information. And then, of course, when we start looking at environmental footprints, if we don't even understand the not so subtle differences in essential amino acids between different foodstuffs, if we're still just talking about protein yield, well, now we have an incorrect estimate of its environmental impact controlling them. When we get more sophisticated, we see a lot of those differences just disappear. I totally agree. Do you think it's a possible, Dr. Ballerstadt, final question, do you think it's possible if we stop growing corn for uh, biofuel, which I think everybody is starting to figure out is a complete and utter waste of time and money, it doesn't really protect the environment at all. If we stop doing that, if we start to reclaim soybean fields for pasture and reclaim cornfields for pasture. Is it possible to scale up animal-based nutrition so that everyone, either, either, do we have enough land? Can we scale up animal agriculture enough to feed everybody what I consider to be a proper human diet? Uh, just, I'm gonna divert to my knee-jerk response. We must. We and must. yes, it's, yeah, and, and it's not hard. And we don't even need to do those things that you set up right? That yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you as far as biofuels is concerned. And, and I don't care much for soybeans, right? All that being said, one of the big products of ethanol production is a protein source that's fed to livestock, right? So, so there's still going to be some kind of integration here. And yes, we haven't even begun to really push the resources that we have, let alone in other countries. When I look at Brazil having three times the cattle that we do, and yet they produce less beef. That's just an example, right? right. So what can we do to improve the productivity and efficiency? We must do this. Yes, I totally agree. Dr. Ballerstad, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, where can people find you if they'd like to learn more about your beliefs and your pontifications? <laughs> you can find me all over social media, uh, grass-based, one word on X, so you got it right, and Instagram, uh, grass-based health on Facebook, uh, by name on YouTube. I have a ruminati.substack.com, um, and, it, you know, there are other talks that I've given um, that you can find on YouTube. Yeah. So He has hours of brilliant lectures all over YouTube. Just search his name on YouTube and you'll find brilliant, brilliant lectures. If you'll send me a link to your Substack, I didn't realize you had one. I got to get caught up on reading that and I will post that in the show notes. Dr. Peter Ballerstadt, everybody. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you.